Well, thank you. And I cannot tell you how excited I am and truly honored to be able to introduce our keynote speaker today. Gary Goodhart, many of you may not know, was a former NASA employee. I mean, does it get any cooler than that? And he was deeply involved in engineering the original iterations of a robotic-assisted surgery, an instrument that has proved so impactful not only in my life, but in thousands of lives of surgeons and patients alike across the world. From a personal level, I see this as a gesture or an acknowledgement of all the work that the body of surgeons have done across the world today. So I cannot tell you how thankful I am. And without further ado, Gary. Uh, for all of you uh, joining today, uh, for those of you who are just uh, looking into robotics for the first time or for those of you who are uh, practicing robotics frequently, I'm, I'm delighted to be with you today and to, and to share a really intuitive perspective um, from, from our, uh, in our own words. Um, I mean, think about general surgery. Uh, da Vinci's are used in urology and gynecology, thoracic surgery, and so on. And, and general surgery uh, presents some unique challenges. Clearly, there's high variance in the patient population, whether it's uh, urgent uh, or, or emergent uh, versus planned surgery, whether it's cancer or benign underlying condition, uh, large variance in practice, a large academic medical centers, a uh, high mix of, of complex procedures and training the next generation of surgeons or high volume community centers or uh, smaller community centers. And, and the profession itself is undergoing massive change and opportunity, um, whether it's adoption of new technologies, consolidation, and so on. And uh, add to that mix uh, COVID and what's happening in the COVID universe. Um, we know in wave one, uh, in intuitive serves, give or take, uh, 65 countries uh, that uh, changed elective surgery and, and even more striking, it, it changed the diagnostic pipeline or pathway for patients. And we see that happening now and see it happening again. Interestingly, some things um, slowed way down. Other things have started to pick up as a result of COVID. And for example, in bariatric surgery, we're seeing patients who are uh, taking control of their own care, uh, seeing that there may be an additional risk in in uh, COVID and, and stepping forward, not only at Intuitive, but at other uh, providers and companies for bariatric surgery. So COVID is with us, uh, will be for some time. We're clearly adjusting as we go. Um, we know that in COVID that the, the delayed diagnostic pipeline is a serious problem. Uh, it's not good for patients. Uh, it's not good for providers. And we've seen this before, at least at Intuitive, when uh, there were changes to uh, PSA testing guidance in urology, uh, it created a large bolus of more advanced disease uh, and patients who had uh, more serious problems. So I'm concerned about this. Uh, I'm sure you are too. And we will, we will go through it together uh, as uh, COVID comes back and as we, as we battle it. Um, at the company, we, we are here to serve you. Uh, we, we align our goals to yours. Uh, the quadruple aim, that's a set of uh, goals that uh, are your words, not ours. But we're serious about it at the company, and we measure our progress and hold ourselves accountable to it. Uh, better outcomes for patients uh, in your hands. Uh, we're not a healthcare company. You are a healthcare provider. You are uh, a better patient experience. Um, uh, more predictable outcomes, a better experience for you, the surgeon, and for your care teams, and lower total cost to treat per patient episode. I think this is more important uh, in the era of COVID and post-COVID, not less so. Um, what do you need from a company that's going to help you in this space or, or support you in this space? Uh, there are, give or take, 25 or 30 companies like ours that have brought robotic-assisted surgery products to market. And uh, there are four or five that are still doing significant things. It can be done, but it's hard. And, and the reason it's hard is it requires a really uh, cross-functional and outstanding team. The details matter. Uh, you need technical mastery, whether it's robotics or imaging, computing, cloud computing and analytics, uh, whether it's clinical mastery, uh, the ability to conduct clinical research with all of you, uh, understanding educational science and training, uh, working hard on human factors. I think uh, Intuitive's Human Factors organization is a, among the best in the world. Uh, it takes operational mas mastery, and by that I mean 
uh, business operations uh, and manufacturing operations. You need to understand workflows extremely well, the, the economics uh, of, of the total program and the understanding of standards out in the world and the creation of new standards when you need them. Um, uh, we've been at it for some time. This is a, a chart of the growth of robotic assisted surgery, da Vinci, da Vinci surgery specifically, in different disciplines. Um, we had our first clinical trials in general surgery in 1999. Uh, we had a, a series of other trials thereafter in cardiac surgery and later in urology. Uh, you see here from 2009, the green line is urology. And at that time, urology was the highest volume um, procedure category that surgeons use da Vinci's for. Uh, the yellow line is gynecology. Uh, gynecology surpassed urology uh, in about 2010, uh, and then they have run up together. And the blue line is general surgery. So while we started our experience in general surgery early on, uh, we didn't really see a strong adoption until much later. And you see it starting to kick up in 2012 kicks up again in 2014 with uh, DaVinci XI coming to market. And, and now it is uh, by far the largest category uh, of procedures. And uh, there, there's a reason for that. And I'll talk to you a little bit about why we think that is. Um, we talk about adoption and often you'll see in business books, I'll tell you a little bit more about adoption in a minute. Uh, adoption doesn't happen because intuitive wills it to happen or wants it to happen. It just, just false. Uh, adoption happens because you find significant value uh, either in patient outcomes, in surgeon performance, in provider environment, or in the payer value expressed in your language as practiced in your environment. In other words, uh, we can talk about it all we want, but if it doesn't bring real value, it will not adopt. Um, and, uh, and that's pretty well known. So uh, here's a chart of the new technology adoption curve. Uh, this has been well understood in business circles for a while. And you know that in a, a new idea comes out, and by the way, it can be technique or technology. A new technique or technology comes out, and there are people who are looking for better. They are constantly uh, on the forefront of driving change. And they'll start to adopt and assess. Those are the innovators and early adopters. At some point, uh, those new ideas do some things better and some things worse than existing technique or existing technology. And then technologists and the leaders uh, in the field start to work on it together. And it is a, a tightly integrated and iterative approach to improve the technologies and improve the technique. And if you succeed, you'll cross the chasm into people who aren't that interested in technology for technology's sake, but they are interested in better for their practice. And that's the early majority. So we, we've been through this cycle a few times. And... Um, uh, one of my mentors and the first CEO of Intuitive, Lonnie Smith, had figured out pretty early on, in the case of Da Vinci, Da Vinci is going to be evaluated procedure by procedure. In other words, it's not, is Da Vinci good for general surgery? The question is, is Da Vinci good for colon surgery? Is it good for hernia repair? Uh, is it good for colorectal disease? Th those are the real questions. It's going to adopt procedure by procedure. And uh, he was right. So uh, graphically, Kind of here's where we are uh, as you look at uh, procedure by procedure. Um, you, you have uh, on the left side, uh, hepatobiliary surgery, um, uh, where we're just early. You see cholecystectomy starting to move up. And this is kind of a view of market share. And then at the higher end in general surgery, we see rectal surgery and now uh, hernia repair, which has moved pretty quickly. Uh, as, as you heard Conrad say, I've, I've been a technologist and been in technology my, really my whole career. And you might say, well, okay, technology is the thing. And, and I disagree. Actually, I've been with technology long enough to know that uh, it is not a silver bullet and it's not magic. Uh, technology is really um, about pairing it with people. And a few years ago, we started asking, and I started asking, um, how many human beings have to do the right thing the day of surgery for the surgeon and the patient, really, to get a great result. And, uh, you know, I just started writing down, how many do we think? And I, we started calling some of the experts in the field of surgical workflow and, and surgical outcomes. And the answer is somewhere between 60 and 80 human beings have to do the right thing the day of surgery for that patient to be assured a good result. And by the way, my own mother is a da Vinci patient. 
And so you think about that, the 80 people, it, it is not technology alone. There's no silver bullet here. Um, it really is a deep understanding of the interactions of technology, design, and populations. So we design for populations, and let's talk about how we do that. Um, first, clearly there's differences in patient populations, uh, both in the United States and globally. With regard to uh, the adult population in the United States, a da Vinci system is designed to uh, succeed in uh, the fifth percentile and the 95th percentile patient. Um, so it's a huge range. If you ask a robot designer, design for the narrow range, you know, 35 to 65, it's a really different problem than 5 to 95. But we want to be able to address a large range of population. If you think about how many people have to interact with one of our systems or products the day of surgery, it's a dozen. And so not only are you designing for the population of patients, you're also designing for a population of professionals, the surgeons, the scrub nurse, the physician's assistants, the robotics coordinators, and everybody else. And so as we go through that, we want to make sure that we can uh, cover their needs. And of course, the situation is even more complex, which is not everybody practices in the same type of institution. So we see a large academic medical center. We see high volume uh, community centers. We see a little bit smaller community centers in different communities. And we want to be able to provide solutions for this diverse set. And that's what we design for. The goal and the way Intuitive thinks about it is, uh, it is not our goal that we sell you a robot. Our, our goal is to help your minimally invasive surgery program reach its goals. And we think robotics and computer-aided uh, systems can make a big difference. And to do that, you need to start with a robot, but that's not enough. Uh, you need to have instruments and accessories, exquisite imaging systems, regulatory approvals, uh, fantastic training methodologies, training technologies, and training plans, workflow, and uh, optimization systems, our Genes Genesis program. We need to engage clinical evidence resources with those of you who are academics. Uh, we have to build sales and support capability in our company uh, to address what's happening in the field. We need to uh, market our uh, technologies, our capabilities, and, and help you with yours. Um, we want to engage the academic medicine side, whether it's residency, fellowship, or research, or surgical societies. And we need to provide economic validation to, uh, to back up the claims about total cost to treat. And this happens procedure by procedure, country by country. Uh, but if the goal is not place a robot, if the goal is, is help uh, enable a highly capable minimally invasive surgery program, that's what it takes. And that's really what we've built. And I'll talk more about that. I showed you the new technology adoption curve. Uh, we now have three platforms of different kinds of systems in the market, and they're at different levels of maturity. And so you can expect from us, and you can expect actually from the community and from the research, different things. Uh, the one that's most advanced, our XI, is, is Gen 4. Um, this has been, uh, a, a, the first generation came out, uh, FDA cleared in 2000. Uh, X and XR are our fourth generation. Uh, it has a very well-developed ecosystem. Um, we have uh, fantastic fifth-generation imaging. I'll show you a little bit about that. A sophisticated hospital analytics, our third generation of integrated stapling uh, portfolio, uh, our fifth-generation imaging, our third generation of advanced uh, energy, and, and we have uh, over 90 different regulatory clearances in five different specialties, and it's quite global. Uh, uh, about a couple a year and a half ago, uh, we brought our single port and natural orifice system, uh, DaVinci SP, into the market. Uh, has broad clearances in Korea for those of you who are Korean surgeons. We have transoral robotic surgery and we have urologic surgery uh, so far cleared in the United States. This is earlier, it's kind of Gen 1.5. Uh, it's in the hand of innovators and early adopters. Uh, they are developing evidence. Uh, so far, so good. It looks great. We're expanding or working on expanding our clinical indications uh, in different places around the world, working with regulators. And um, Surgeons using it are optimizing technique. We are working with them to optimize the technology, and we're developing out our ecosystem. We also have a flexible robotics program called ION. Um, we think this will be a platform that ultimately will be able to reach uh, various parts of the body through natural orifices. It's starting in bronchoscopy as a, as a tool to help with diagnostics of suspicious lesions in the lung. 
Uh, the evidence so far in development looks fantastic. Uh, they are likewise optimizing technique. Uh, we are also integrating it into our ecosystem and working on uh, additional ideas and indications in time. So you can see here, we're working through it. Um, some things are quite mature. Uh, there's an enormous amount of evidence. Some things are in evidence in development. As you think about where we are now, um, it's interesting. Uh, the, the progression of how your hospitals adopt uh, in the early phases of robotic surgery, they would buy one. Uh, they'd install it and start to develop their robotic surgery program. As they found value, they'd start to operationalize it, build it into the schedules, build it into um, uh, block times. And what we're seeing now is something different. Uh, the last few years, we've started to see people standardize their robotic-assisted surgery programs. And what do I mean by that? Uh, if you look out, this is United States data, but if you look out and ask how many hospitals have five or more da Vinci systems on a single uh, OR floor, in other words, not owned by the same institution, but literally in the same building, uh, that number has grown 450% over the last three years. So they're not looking at it as, okay, I have a robot, that's fine, I have a robotics program. Rather, they're saying, what does a robotics program do to a great minimally invasive surgery program? And then how do I start to standardize on it? And why do I get value in that standardization? So we saw this. We've seen this happening the last couple of years. And we've started to ask, why, why is that? Why, why are folks ready to do this now? Um, and I think it's the following. Uh, this is data from the end of 2019. Uh, at the end of 2019, there were over 21,000 peer-reviewed journal articles written about da Vinci. Everything from single center studies and feasibility work to uh, RCTs to uh, large real world evidence. And one of the things we see, and we've, this is true for medicine as a whole, not just a robotic assisted surgery, is that a single peer reviewed paper is unlikely to change practice. And there's good reasons for that. And that is roughly that uh, any one person reading it says, well, that may be true for the five academic centers that were involved in the study, but I'm in a community center in a different location. I'm not sure it applies to my population, or I have a different experience than those surgeons. I'm not sure it applies to me. And so folks look at it and they're not sure how it applies, but something has really changed the last five or six years. And that is that many of the institutions that you work with have invested in electronic health records. And those electronic health records, if you can get access to the data and analyze it, start to allow you to make decisions about your own surgical programs with your own set of surgeons, your own performance in your patient population. And in essence, it's your data and your truth, and it can be built into dashboards or rerun on a periodic basis so you can see trends. We have, In 2019, we worked with uh, over 270 hospitals. We did an analysis with their partnership and engagement you know, over 600 times and looking in that assessment. And we started to see that people can now really identify truly what is the value of a robotic-assisted program in their hands. Um, so we think of this as your data, your analysis, your truth. Uh, the data sets are fairly large. The math we do on it is pretty simple. It's not like it's crazy sophistic sophisticated algorithms. We'll talk about that later. But it, it's querying your own data. It, it's unbelievable to me. I think it's fantastic. So what does that look like? You can ask a simple question. How much MIS is going on in our hospital system? You'd be shocked. I have been shocked at how uh, few people know the actual answer. Uh, many people think that there's more MIS in their program than there actually is. And that's because they're thinking about themselves. They're, they're tending to think about, hey, I'm committed to MIS and therefore we do a lot. But actually, if you look at the data, you see less. Uh, it's not an incredibly hard analysis to do. You just look in the data sets. It's worth doing. This is just an example of a particular hospital. Uh, it's a real example. It's not uh, the, the highest robotic surgery uh, program hospital, nor the lowest, somewhere in the middle. You can ask, well, relative to open and laparoscopy and robotics for a particular procedure, in this case, it's a colon procedure, um, what's my readmission rate? And it turns out in this one example that, that the readmission rates are lowest for robotics, second lowest for lab, and highest for open. Um, you can look at ICU time, uh, ICU uh, commitment percentage, and robotics in this example was the lowest, um, seems relevant and important in today's day and age. You can look at conversion rate, lab to uh, open, and see what that variance is. Um, you can start asking questions about variance between surgeons. 
Uh, and sometimes it's robotic and robotic technique. Sometimes it's surgical technique has nothing to do with robotics. Sometimes it's the adoption of ERAS and, and other protocols. But you can ask that set, see who your outliers are, and then start sharing best practice and save money. You can save time in the hospital. You can save ICU resources. So really straightforward. It's fantastic. It gives you a chance to, to take action against the data you have in your hands. And so this in this example, this hospital was looking for um, saving uh, uh, hospital uh, beds. Uh, they wanted to save days so that uh, they could care for more patients in the hospital. And doing some of their benchmarking, they were able to save 400 bed days, which is amazing and, and a fantastic thing on a pretty simple data set. We are bringing to you now uh, an app for your uh, smartphone, something in your hand. Um, Intuitive has been the internet of things for surgical robots for a little over a decade now. Uh, so we have a bunch of data in the cloud. We have, uh, give or take, 8 million procedures uh, of data. You have all this powerful cloud data. A DaVinci system or an ION system or an SP system is a super powerful computer, a supercomputer in your OR. And the nice thing about this smartphone is it's the link, it's the connection in your hand between the cloud and this powerful supercomputer, which is your system. And so uh, this is just rolling out now. Uh, it will start doing simple things for you, simple but powerful. And so one of the things it'll do is allow you to, to look at your uh, case data, your own personal case data. Uh, it'll, it'll allow you to trend it. Um, what kind of procedures are you doing? Uh, how long is it taking you? What's your operative time look like? It will look at resource consumption. What kind of instruments and accessories are you using? Um, it's also your personal identifier with you. So if you go from uh, one DaVinci system at one hospital to a different Gen 4 system in another one, it carries all your preferences with you. It recognizes who you are when you sit down. It takes care of it. It's your portal into our learning management program. So as you're learning, it will give you context-sensitive uh, uh, suggestions about where your learning might go next. And it also allows you to manage your public profile for when you're on a physician locator and uh, you're interested in how patients might find you. So again, it's just that simple link. You've come to expect this out of uh, uh, technology companies, and it's really integrating that idea into robotics. Um, we've achieved a lot to date. Um, uh, we're, we're, we won't uh, injure our arms patting ourselves on the back. I, I think there's a lifetime worth of improvement that's required. Um, and anybody who has gone through uh, our systems and surgery on the sterile side of the drape as a patient uh, knows that, that the status quo is not good enough. Um, so what can we do about it? How can intuitive help? Um, first, we, we know that general surgery community has really differing needs. Uh, we think about our ecosystem and try to design with those differing needs in mind. Um, huge amount of general surgery is done in the community. Um, in the academic settings, we see both high variance and complexity, the next generation of surgeons being trained, uh, and important research being done. And lastly, clearly oncology as it relates to general surgery is um, a major opportunity for improvement in outcomes. How can we contribute? So uh, for starters, as we go through it, uh, we've talked about ecosystems. What I'll tell you is there have been a lot of different systems out there, some that Intuitive has made, others that have been made by other products. Um, details really, really matter. Um, I'm a believer that uh, races are won by fractions of a second. Um, it's one thing to run, but it's another thing to be uh, a top performer, and, th and that means really understanding it deeply. I'll give you just one example. Um, this is our new generator. We call it E100 for a vessel sealing instrument. Um, and you see the new one on the left and our benchmark, our older one on the right. And the one on the left has lower thermal spread and it, and it seals in about one third the time. And you might look at this video and you might say, well, what difference does four seconds or five seconds make? But if you're sealing 20 or 30 or 40 times a case, it's about allowing you to go where you want to go and do what you want to do. And I think these details really matter. Um, uh, here's uh, likewise a sealer in the, in the left hand and, and combine this now with uh, our third generation of robotic stapling or DaVinci stapling, uh, our Sureform stapler. Highly stable, uh, best articulation out there, 
uh, grip sensing so that we can estimate how much tissue is in the jaw and have a pretty good idea of, of staple quality. And uh, combine these two things, and now you have the tool, the computer, helping you deliver these technologies. Again, seamless. We're trying to make it easy for you and go where you need to go. And in essence, great technology gets out of the way. It enables you, and it gets out of the way. Uh, we're on our fifth generation stereo endoscopy. Um, for those of you in Gen 4, uh, we launched uh, roughly a year ago, just coming out into full volume now, our Endoscope Plus. And you can see the difference in the left side, the detail and the acuity, and, and just our, our prior generation, Gen 4, on the right. Um, one on the left is uh, the, the highest quality stereo camera uh, on the market uh, for endoscopy. It is fantastic, and it's a win-win. It is a better endoscope and it is more robust, it has, it's more durable. Uh, the engineers have done a fantastic job. So I look at these things, I get excited by them. I think the details count. Um, uh, fluorescence imaging, you, you see here uh, Conrad, a video f uh, by Conrad using uh, Firefly and biliary imaging. And we see um, fantastic results. And so far in cholecystectomy, uh, you all are using it in over 55% of the cases. So here's uh, something that was new in a well-done minimally invasive surgery, and now we're seeing broad adoption. We're working on augmented reality. This is a partial nephrectomy, so this is a kidney cancer. Um, uh, surgeons have this already. They have preoperative CT scans. We use a cloud and machine learning. Uh, we create a segmented model that identifies structures the surgeon can look at it on their iPad prior to the case. They can share it with the patient and go through what they're going to do prior to the case. And then they can import it into their DaVinci system for use during the case. The early data coming out of this has been fantastic. In other words, how often does it change clinical decision-making? And what we're seeing is a fair amount of the time, a surgeon might do a uh, a more healthy tissue sparing because they feel more confident, or if they see something they didn't see uh, or didn't expect to see, they might be do a more radical surgery to, to increase safety. So um, we, we think it matters, and it's an amazing thing. Here, you've had that data. It actually existed. It was sitting in your PAC system. We just made it easy to access. We illuminated it. Uh, we've also added uh, the ability to see ultrasound. So you can have a preoperative image, in, uh, in your view, you can have the interoperative view, and you, can, and you can pair it with an ultrasonic image. So again, thinking about oncology, we think this matters. Um, SP, a quick, a quick one. This is uh, the highest volume uh, prostatectomy surgeon, DVP, uh, Vip Patel, doing an XI case on the left and an SP, single port version of DVP, on the right. And the reason I show you this video is that at the, at the tissue, you see... Uh, very much the same capability, despite the fact that you've actually done port minimization, you've gone down to one, the one port you'll extract the specimen from. We know, all of us know, there are opportunities for machine learning and AI and a ton of jargon in this space. Um, I think you ought to ask, what are you really doing? That's great, thank you, what are you really doing? Um, uh, I think this is interesting. And uh, so our goal is to use these tools, they're tools, they're not magic, uh, they're tools to help accelerate and augment expertise. Uh, this is, we've been at this now about eight years. Uh, this is what our computer scientists help the computer to see during a case. We can actually look at the case, identify the tools, and actually understand by what we see in the image and what we see in the tools where the surgeon is during the case. This is an inexperienced surgeon. Same case, here's an experienced surgeon. And so first you see the difference in case time, but actually you can start to see differences in technique. Okay, well, what can you do with that? Um, the first thing is you can look at learning. This is actually, uh, in the case of a sleeve gastrectomy, same kind of analysis done by the computer to watch somebody through the learning curve. And we can start backing out, well, what are they learning? What should they learn faster? Where are their opportunities? And then we can turn around and take those things and put it into a tool, a computer tool that's hooked up to the cloud. This is a, a, something we're working on, not in the market yet, so that the learner can go through and say, hey, relative to... Uh, the, the expert, here's where I need to improve. And by the way, here are suggestions about technique improvement. And you can ask, well, Gary, that's nice. Looks powerful. On the other hand, does it change outcomes? And some of you are doing studies on this. And the answer is it appears to change outcomes. Pretty cool. So um, this will help us accelerate learning. 
Uh, many of you are using our online tools for uh, learning management, surgeon learning management. There are 73,000 or more uh, surgeons who are now in this. You'll have access to it in your, the palm of your hand. It's context sensitive, so it will know where you are in your learning journey and suggest for you where you might go next. Uh, we've invested in virtual reality and in addition to augmented reality. Um, we have uh, over 9,000 simulated surgery hours just in the last three months, uh, covering about 118,000 surgical tasks. Uh, you can combine this data with your learning management system data and so, again, start to develop and accelerate a learning profile. So just as we close, um, we think together with you, we've made great progress. I, I think there's a lifetime of challenge that remains. Um, here we are in COVID, uh, in a second surge. Uh, I think the quadruple aim becomes more relevant than ever. Um, we need better outcomes. Uh, patients need to be respected through this process. Uh, we cannot overload our care teams with uh, technologies that are harder to use or uh, distracting and our health systems demand lower total cost to treat. There are two ways to get there. Uh, one way is to stop paying people and ration care, and another way is to drive better care that, that creates lower downstream costs. Um, I think we together ought to be driving better care that lowers the downstream costs. I think data is and access to data that can be made in actionable and converted into knowledge is gonna change the way uh, surgery is practiced in a decade. And I think cloud computing and informatics are the backbone that allow that to happen. Lastly, what you ought to expect out of Intuitive, I think in any organization in this space, um, we're early. Uh, and therefore, you want that organization to be entrepreneurial. You want it to be demonstratedly competent, fantastic at making these complex products that work at high quality and clinically grounded. And it all has to be built on driving the quadruple aim. Anyway, Conrad, and, and to the team, um, thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here, and I look forward to chatting further.